Hi, and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by T-Spines and Mexsoft about how to simply and affordably create and manufacture organic designs. I am your host, Matt Cedarberg from T-Spines, Inc., and um, we're also here with Anita Annan, the Senior Vice President of Sales at Mexsoft. Hello, everyone. Um, I have here with me Uday from our uh, support group who will help you answer any questions regarding RhinoCam. Um, we will be uh, waiting here online for any questions that we could help you out with. Okay, great. And then our presenter today is Rainer Schmidt, the owner of Complex Consulting. Hi everybody, it's an honor to uh, present those two products which we use to uh, earn our money with. Okay, so today Rainer will show the complete process of how to create a simple organic model with T-splines and then use RhinoCam to lay out the tool paths and then he'll actually show um, machining the part. So just to introduce the, the products before we turn the time over to Rainer, um, T-Spines is a product that greatly speeds up the creation of high-quality organic designs. RhinoCam is powerful cam software, and both products plug right into Rhino to provide a simple, affordable solution for creating organic designs. So here's just a few examples. And also, before we get into this, um, just some housekeeping. Everyone, all the attendees are muted throughout the webinar, but we would really uh, look forward to interacting with you. And the way to do that is to just type in questions on the side of your screen. And throughout the webinar, then we'll be typing back answers, and also we'll, we'll be asking them to Rainer as that's, as that's appropriate. So please ask questions throughout the webinar. So just some examples of, um, of using T-Spines and RhinoCam together. Uh, JEH Guitars uses T-Spines to make the distinctive shape of their guitars then creates the tool path with RhinoCam and then goes ahead and, and actually machines the, the uh, guitars. The Animax Designs uses T-Spines to design parts for animatronics characters, then machines a mold using RhinoCam. And then here's just an example of one of our free T-Spines models you can get on our website. A user emailed us back a photo that he machined the part in metal using RhinoCam. So you can see there's a lot of different ways to use RhinoCam to, to make physical objects. And it's one thing to see images of that, but it's another to actually see someone take a design through the entire process. So that's what Rainer will do um, over the next 45 minutes. Um, so just to more properly introduce Rainer and complex, and complex Consulting. Complex Consulting is a service provider offering metal fabrication, fine woodworking, casting, CNC prototyping, 3D printing, and other services. They specialize in complex hybrid projects. One neat recent project was working with Mesh Masters to design a 3D scanner rig which allows the capture of mesh data in real time. Complex Consulting also offers training in 3D modeling, rendering, and toolpath generation with a host of software packages. They train both on-site and at their headquarters in New Jersey, which is just 20 minutes away from the Penn Station in Manhattan. When they train you at their headquarters, the metal and woodworking routers are available to actually produce the parts created during the training. So I'd like to thank Rainer for actually volunteering to put on this webinar with us. And on a final note, I'll just like to mention that at the end of the webinar, as a special thank you for staying around, we'll offer a valuable coupon uh, just for webinar attendees. So with that, let's make Rainer the presenter. <clears throat> So um, I guess um, I'm live now. Uh, yeah, just go ahead and click showing to show your screen. Oh, there we go. Okay, we're all, all good to go? Okay, yeah, you look great. Good, excellent. So um, I welcome everybody for my, uh, to my little presentation here. Um, as Matt mentioned, we do a lot and make a lot around the 3D theme. Um, here as a background, a recently machined part um, which is part of a door we're producing together with a uh, associate. Um, and I just have to uh, close my little screen here without uh, getting it into my way, the invisible screen. Then um, here's a piece of jewelry I'm personally working on, which has been commissioned in the meantime. And let's go right back into our original theme, which is Rhino 3D and Microsoft and T-Splines. Um, I just as a very small 
Xcurse because I know there are quite a few people who have signed up who come from other modeling packages. I just <coughs> want to introduce a very quickly made model here in this case in Cinema 4D. Uh, it could be a Modo or any other application. And I exported this as a polygonal model into uh, a Rhino and take this instead of starting to model something very quickly uh, manually to start off to show a very few very basic uh, capabilities uh, of uh, T-splines. Um, and the first capability, of course, is the, ab uh, the ability to convert into a, a T-spline mesh, which now has happened. Uh, obviously, uh, not a lot has happened, except uh, the uh, shading errors have disappeared, which were there because of normals uh, imported from the other application. But now with uh, control shift, uh, control space, which switches on the um, T-spline uh, plugin, uh, and a uh, smooth toggle, you can see instantly that we have a the ability to show an incredibly complex organic uh, shape. And this is not prepared, this is real time, this is not taking ages, this is not uh, uh, taking a lot of time. And I can now feel free to manipulate this uh, uh, object in any way I want to, in, a, in either the organic uh, fashion or uh, in the uh, original uh, uh, fashion. And I can always switch on uh, the uh, a point display, so I see the control frame, I can select points, uh, I can distort the mesh uh, in real time to meet um, design requirements or just experiment with the shape. And the uh, stability of this plugin, we had a, we, we did a, uh, um, a cold run uh, for this presentation and we did a lot of evil things in that, in that, that pre-run and uh, I always find myself after hours um, slightly horrified that I forgot to save all day. So I don't want to go too far into this um, um, pushing around of uh, geometry here because it, it has really everything uh, somebody wants to see in a, uh, a sort of a box, box modeling uh, um, paradigm. And together with Rhino, it is providing CAD precision, which is usually not the case in uh, those 3D animation packages like Cinema 4D Maya or uh, Modo per se. So uh, now I'll just leave this model as it is and go back to uh, the original project we uh, have chosen for this uh, presentation. Hey Rainer, just to yes. step in, thanks for that brief introduction of T-Spines and, and as you'll, you'll see throughout the rest of Rainer's presentation, he'll be focused really on some very basic T-Spines functions just to kind of get an introduction of how it can be used uh, to machine something. We'll have time for more, more in-depth T-Spine questions at the end of the webinar if, if you have any of those. And I just, Rainer, just some feedback, um, there's, there's getting a, some people are getting a little bit of feedback. If you want to maybe push the mic a little bit farther away from your from your face, then we might get a little bit better sound quality. Uh, how's that? that um, right? Yeah, maybe just a little bit closer. It's a little bit faint. Um, <clears throat> ben, ben, how's that? Uh, that sounds great. Yeah, I'll, I'll let yeah. you know. That sounds Thank good. You. Thank you. So, basically, um, we all know that uh, you can use and I'll just uh, quickly do it um, uh, because I prepared uh, a very, very uh, a quick uh, demonstration graphic here. Um, you can use any bit image as a background image uh, for Rhino and then uh, take the uh, curve tools to uh, sketch around the geometry very, I mean, uh, the, the, the design uh, which you receive very quickly and kind of create a, uh, a blocked out um, uh, view of this, uh, which you can of course then also uh, switch off and you're left with the uh, underlying uh, 
structure you created. So starting from this, I uh, roughed out a, um, uh, this kind of slipped a little bit, but it's of no consequence. Um, a B, let's imagine a client came and said, we, we, we need a B machined um, for uh, uh, whatever, a uh, sign in a store or just imagine something. So I prepared a little um, um, video to speed up uh, the creation of this, but it all comes down to uh, the construction of a um, flat, basically polygonal setup, which is then inflated and converted into a uh, T-spline mesh. Um, of course, I could just select this curve and extrude it with Rhino. And when I do that, I could bevel the edges and have a nice organic looking shape. But if you have ever worked with Rhino, you know things in the NURBS world are never that ideal. And I left this hard corner in here, for example, um, just for that purpose, because this is a uh, stumbling block uh, which will destroy the, the flow of the curves and, and force Rhino to make a break here and we will have a very hard time with that corner uh, to smooth that over into a nice beveled uh, surface uh, for the top of the B, for example. So I don't want to um, stay on this topic for too long, but a harsh corner, a lot of issues with NURBS modeling. In the end, it's only a patchwork. Um, makes T-spline so valuable, as you can see in a second. Um, so let's take a quick look at this uh, video. Uh, I have to be a little bit careful here so I don't hit any buttons on my uh, webinar screen. <coughs> and this is the media player. Yeah, just as a very short um, introduction, um, we're here at the idea stage. Uh, we can, uh, in the Rhino world, as I named it here, uh, we can import meshes. Uh, we can convert them into T-splines, uh, which can be converted into T-spline meshes. After we are happy with uh, our construction, we can have Rhino NURBS meshes, of course, which we can also convert into Rhino meshes. Um, the word meshes is used a few times because Rhino CAM is utilizing the meshes to create the uh, so-called uh, G-code, which is the data which is transported from our Rhino world to a physical machine. And the G-code, and you will see that in a, in a minute, is a very simple language which defines where a cutting tool should go. Then there's a machine controller software which converts the uh, instructions into actual moves of motors and then we enter reality, which means noise, dirt, movements, shaping, happening, and uh, a physical result. So this is basically what we are running through here very quickly. Um, we're about to uh, get into this in detail, and I will pull this up as a roadmap uh, as, as we go. Um, here is a, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of, made the screenshot because I said in the presentation um, on the web, uh, it's our Swiss army knife. <laughs> so usually people put that off, but this is actually what I'm running around with all the time. This is the uh, Rhino Cam dongle. Uh, this is a memory uh, <coughs> plug with, which contains a G-code, which I carry from the office into the machine shop uh, to feed the uh, machine controller. Is it? So literally it's our Swiss army knife. Then uh, this is the uh, machine prototype which we'll use um, to demonstrate this. This is a gantry. This is a uh, uh, for the z-axis which moves up and down, the cutting tool up and down. This is a gearbox for that. Um, here's the motor which uh, moves the gantry from the left to the right. And uh, this machine is, um, looks a little bit uh, skeletonized, but it's built for speed. The, uh, machine is a 4 by 8, covers 4 feet by 8 feet and can cut through the diagonal in less than one second. So this is a 4 by 6 uh, steel beam uh, with all solid aluminum on it, so you can imagine the forces on the motors um, to accelerate the machine and decelerate the machine so quickly. So we are using in this sample a, a very small cutting tool with a sixteenth of an inch diameter made out of a carbide, a carbide solid carbide alloy 
and I can actually snap it off with my finger if I would uh, put pressure on it. Um, I just mention it so you can appreciate the accuracy of the toolpath generated by the Maxoft product because if, if there would be any hiccups in there, it would just snaps a bit off. And um, of course, the precision of the surface is generated by the T-spline uh, algorithms. And uh, foremost, uh, of course, uh, our godlike skills to build a machine like this. <laughs> so um, I'll just um, let this uh, skip for a second. I just uh, used a very cheap uh, Vado uh, uh, camera, which actually did a very good job in recording this. Um, so we have a gantry. We have we are using uh, steel-loaded timing belts for this. They are they are tension was about 300 pounds uh, and sound like a guitar uh, string and there is no flex, no movement, so this uh, saves a lot of cost. Uh, I wouldn't use this necessarily for a metal machine, but we can uh, stay within two thousandths uh, to three thousandths of an inch accuracy. So down here we have the uh, cutting spindle which we will use with the, uh, uh, with the cutting tool uh, in there. So, um, and the victim, which is this board here. Um, then uh, we have uh, the machine controller. Um, he, the data arrives here, is converted into steps. Uh, this is uh, just a light show to see uh, for the prototype what is engaged, what is running, because sometimes motors are not spinning, but you can see a signal that helps a lot in, in, in the analysis of uh, errors. Here is the uh, high power servo drive suit we use and they co-developed. Uh, so this is the uh, system which is uh, powering the motors basically. Next to it is a uh, old IBM laptop which runs um, um, the machine controller software which talks through a USB port with that box. And I'll just try here is the so-called G code which you can see in a few minutes scrolling through uh, when the machine is running. And here is a digital readout where the uh, machine is located, where the cutting tool tip is located physically in 3D space. And then there are a lot of options regarding uh, speed adjustments, coolant on and off and dust collector and so on. And next to it I just build up a little pile of cutting tools for um, the people who are not uh, um, familiar with those. This is called uh, ball end mill, a big one, half an inch diameter. Ball end mill because it is round at the end. Here is a flat uh, end mill. Here is a uh, V cutting tool. It's like a little pyramid. Uh, this is the tool, the brother of the tool, which is uh, currently chucked in the uh, spindle. Then we have all sorts of diameters, shapes, and uh, this actually is known as inappropriate tool. So that's why it smoked out a little bit. We tried a little bit with cheap router bits and it doesn't really work. Um, here is a laser which I can chuck into that uh, spindle. The laser allows me with a very fine point to, pre to precisely position the spindle center over a part where I want to cut, so to set the coordinates. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, just to say, the, if, if you have a tool which has a very bizarre um, geometry, which is not in the library of Maxsoft, then uh, the Maxsoft software allows you to draw the tool um, shape, outline, and define it. And later, um, you can simulate the uh, created tool path, and it will show the correct um, cutting geometry uh, while you define your own little uh, fantastic tool, which you had made somewhere. Um, yeah, so basically, that is this part, and. Um, at this point, I I will go back and go into the uh, the modeling part a little bit. So, Rainer, as you go back to uh, to showing us how this is modeled, um, I think it's I mean for someone that sits in front of a computer all day, it's kind of amazing to me that it actually is going to the T spine design is going to come out of there. Someone asked a question; they missed the intro. How many axes is on your mill? Uh, we have actually, it's a, um, um, the way you see it, it is a four axis mill and um, uh, you can see we have those um, <laughs> actually screwdrivers. I sent Matt a very, very large screwdriver once to humor him and uh, this is the um, uh, part we made on our so-called fourth axis, it's a rotary axis. 
but uh, basically this is a uh, three-axis router. It moves an X and Y and Z uh, orientation, but we can put another uh, unit uh, onto this bed, which allows us to uh, spin things around, which is uh, defining the fourth axis. Um, but we also have now a uh, five-axis head, which allows us to move the spindle in uh, five coordinates, so we can actually mill a uh, hemisphere uh, uh, yeah, uh, perpendicular with a cutting tool to the surface at all times. Okay. Um, we've, we're getting a lot more questions about your mill setup. I, I think maybe we'll come back to those at, at, once you go through the modeling, and then we can see, kind of, kind of talk about it at that point. But just one, one, one question while you're getting this up. How much does a machine like that cost? Um, if you take a look at simply the parts, and you would just shop for parts and, and buy them off uh, the web or so, then uh, you're about, with a 4 by 8 machine, you're about at uh, $10,000. And if you have it built, you have to add another month uh, to two of uh, a shop machining the parts. Um, of, of course, a uh, off-the-shelf machine is, uh, can be cheaper or way more expensive. The expense of the machine is determined by the um, uh, by by a few choices like um, uh, which kind of linear bearings are you using, how big, how small, how which quality, which tolerances. Then uh, there are different ways to uh, move the axis, either with a stepper motor, like um, uh, how should I say they they are pulsed motors. They they kind of rotate in fixed angles. Um, they're 2.7 degrees per step. Uh, 200 steps per rotation and no feedback to the computer. So if the computer says do 10 steps and everybody prays it did it, if it ran into something, it didn't and you have an offset. So servo motors give feedback to the machine through a rotating sector disk at the end, which is a, a, a sort of a light gate. And all this feedback stuff and electronics associated to that is making things a little bit more expensive. So, but Part-wise, you're about around $10,000, and then you probably add the same thing for machining and, and time to, to build one. So I'd say uh, a 4 by 8 machine, which is uh, fast, accurate, and reliable, is about $20,000. Okay. Well, good. And now it looks like there's some more questions about your exact specs that I'll pass on to you at the end of this, but that, that's good to get a, a ballpark for that. Good. So uh, in the meantime, I managed to load the uh, little... Uh, a modeling session. Um, I have to apologize for the black stripes in here. I used a very quick, uh, uh, quickly set up um, uh, software with screen capture software, um, and <laughs> I hadn't had time to re-record it. So bear with me. The black stripes are just there for uh, because of my um, lack of uh, time. So we have this B in the background, and uh, you can see um, I will start to create a uh, patch, a, sing a single polygon with uh, uh, the T-spline toolkit. I could also use uh, Rhino and simply uh, convert a Rhino uh, surface into a T-spline and go from there. There are many ways to roam as usual. And I'll just skip a little bit ahead. Here we got that thing. And then what I'm doing is uh, nothing else. And extend that patch with more geometry. And it really works very quickly. And if you mess up, you have a gap here um, to uh, weld points and, and find errors. Um, it's, it's very simple. Um, points turn uh, into different colors if you have a problem there uh, to notify you about it. And uh, to weld things, uh, you, you can very quickly select uh, points. And you can also uh, determine which point snaps to which point to weld it, uh, depending on the way you uh, select those. And of course, uh, Rhino snapping, which I like uh, a lot personally, is uh, completely integrated. So um, while I am creating those patches here, it, it snaps automatically to those uh, lines around it. Um, so making it like pretty much like a monkey uh, 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 deal to, to follow the curves. Um, the only thing I'm keeping in mind here is that I'm sort of perpendicular with those points because it gives uh, T-spline a nice opportunity to uh, uh, create uh, 
have very decent uh, results at the end. And uh, of course, you, the more detailed you do this, the less chance you give these plants to do its magic. So you have to find a compromise, which is easily uh, 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 the experience is easily gained after a couple of sessions to see how dense you want to make this uh, to 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 enable these plants to do a real good job, or how detailed you do it to um, have more control yourself. So I'll just skip a little bit because this is like uh, yeah. So so the same. Rainer, one thing I like about your approach to T-splines is I think you're using a, a ground total of, is this one command you, you, you've you used so far? All you're doing is appending faces, is that right? Yeah, this right now it's appending faces. I, I, I usually, um, I don't use tools in general because they are fancy functions. I use them because they're extremely friendly and they help me a lot. So, <laughs> the, uh, yes, um, but I must tell you, I, I, I used in the meantime uh, uh, in various projects, I use a lot of T-spline functionality, but for things like this, uh, you only need two, two or three commands to go very, very, very far. Yeah, and Rainer and I talked about this before the webinar. I, I mean, I would love, I always love to show off a lot of T-spline tools when I give demos, but I, I really like Rainer's approach of just, I mean, really, he, I think he'll use two, two commands through this whole process, and our our goal was not necessarily to to show all the all the amazing things you can do, but just to show if you can learn two commands, um, you can make something that looks pretty cool. Um, it's it's an interesting point you're just uh, picking up. Um, it is, and and I just say here, I what I do is I I select this um, patch I created, it's a big one, and I just uh, say one other uh, command. It's a it's a thickness command. Uh, which just uh, bulges it up, and then I have another command which um, I've shown before. Uh, here I got a uh, a welding point uh, thingy, and of course I can uh, fix this. But um, not to forget my point is um, when you would buy Rhino T splines and Rhino Cam, and you have seen this presentation, you can achieve the same within the day you get all the stuff. It might take you a little bit longer to stop breaking tools, but uh, um, it, it is extremely efficient and it does not require uh, years of training just to, to build those patches, for example. It's, uh, the more you learn, the more you know about it, of course your results can become better, you gain more control, but um, to unpack something, to roll up the sleeves and use that hammer to beat the heck out of a problem, it is really only a very short amount of time. So, uh, and, and it sounds like I'm a, I'm a plant. Um, I, I am not. I'm, I'm not associated. I'm not getting any uh, benefits uh, out of this presentation. I am just a very happy user who hates tools which are making his uh, uh, day more complicated than necessary. And I love tools which uh, are just hanging on the wall. I could just take them off the wall. I use them and I put them back and uh, look at the great results I uh, achieve. So uh, enough of the glory and honor uh, pep speech. <laughs> it, it, uh, it really if, comes down to it. It says there's nothing. Um, and if I can just explain a little bit about what's going on here. So Rainer's just laying out. You can yeah, you can leave the video running. Um, Rainer's just laying out these four-sided patches. And then when he when he runs the thicken command, what it's doing is it's it's basically giving it a a 3D volume and and smoothing everything. So you can see here the difference between the flat patches that he's laying out that he's laying out, and you can see the smooth um, surface that he's already thickened. And um, and that's just a very a very basic way of of creating a, a free form surface. And, and you'll notice that there it handles. Uh, intersections really well, as you can see that Y branch with his B, and all That's of that. That's a big, big problem otherwise, yeah. Yeah, and all that smooth, this just kind of comes automatically when you lay out the patches and then thicken it. And of course, the, uh, the real elegance is that you have the total control over this, because um, woodworking, and probably not everybody uh, listening is into woodworking, the, um, the, the usual way it works is uh, you, you work in very coarse steps your, your way towards a very fine product. And uh, T-Splines allows you the same way to, of thinking, where you are roughing out a, uh, 
uh, uh, patches. I mean, really, that wasn't very elegant what you've seen. It's, it was very rough and intentionally kept uh, very rough, so people might think, good Lord, this will never result in anything uh, sexy. And now, you, now I can take all those control points and very quickly adjust them a little bit finer. Well, it would have taken a lot of time um, if I would have t started to add that kind of accuracy in, a, in an earlier stage. So T-splines jumps into the gap. I can just go and uh, push and pull. If I would have organized the snapping a little bit better, I was a little bit lazy here with the recording. If I would have uh, chosen a little bit better snapping uh, options, then I would not select the uh, outline all the time, for example. <laughs> but um, uh, again, uh, somebody who uses this the first time, he will struggle the same way as I just uh, try to maneuver around. You look at all the, the little pop-ups, what do you want to select? But in this demonstration, I think it's pretty helpful to see that you actually get those helps uh, from all the modules involved. So it's a overall very friendly experience if you start to uh, work with uh, those tools. And what we're doing here is extremely complex, actually. The, uh, uh, all the math involved, all the geometry changes, uh, they're just incredible. And uh, what we do in the meantime, uh, in a lot of cases, is we're so confident in, in using all the stuff that we allow uh, clients to look at uh, the screen when we're when we're defining toolpaths and say, listen, this is what you want. Is this better? Do you want to have it bulged out a little bit? And um, it 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 is a great way to uh, instill confidence uh, in what you're doing and uh, involves the customer in just where he hasn't been involved before, so it's actually been very beneficial for uh, um, a new business and uh, exploiting uh, existing business a little bit better. So yeah. if, I, if I can just step in one, once more, so, so what Rainer's done is he's blocked out the T-spine, now he's, he's going in and moving the control point so that it's, it's coming to within his tolerance of, of his curves. There's, there's definitely ways to use T-splines to nail the curves at the start without having to do oh, this yeah. dragging afterwards. And I, I can show some of that afterwards, but um, but I think this is a great intro and, and probably time to move on to, to show RhinoCam now. Exactly. So this is basically the um, the idiot's way of using uh, T-splines uh, right out of the box, um, just to snap to an outline, utilize the ability of T-splines to uh, work its magic in the background specifically regarding uh, smooth shapes, forms, um, intersections, and other nastinesses which are uh, definitely uh, giving a little bit more of a headache uh, in uh, um, other packages, even Rhino itself. So here we go, we got the, uh, the model itself and uh, now we will involve uh, RhinoCam which is uh, now the next step. I think I still have uh, that little road map but well, we're now creating, we're not playing with the meshes anymore, we'll just uh, uh, take the shape and uh, try to generate a tool pass. I prepared another scene for this, so not to cheat anything, but um, just to, uh, uh, is that one? Yeah. I don't think so. Let me just uh, be sure that I have so right, oh this is the one, okay, here we go. So I got the, the right model here, I made a jump ahead, I um, uh, created a mesh out of T-splines and I used, um, Matt criticized me for that already, um, that I used a relatively coarse uh, setting for the mesh generation. Um, he is right, it could look much more uh, sexy. Um, but for the machining, you always have to keep in mind uh, what machine um, parameters you're using and how fine do you need it. Um, this mesh here is smooth enough that if I would take a piece of sandpaper later and run it over the surface, um, I'm already better with the sandpaper than in the inaccuracies in this model. So what's been uh, showing up maybe as shading problems in a 3D demonstration is in real life laughable, it's not there. So, uh, and this is the mesh uh, we're using, I uh, set this into a surface um, just for demonstration purposes and I open the machine browser again 
Uh, RhinoCam is a plugin which is as well very easy to use uh, right out of the start um, and which bears immense complexity if you require it. Uh, but it's not hiding the complexity, but it doesn't necessarily make it necessary to uh, delve into it too much. So, uh, excuse me, this is Joe. There was a question about what you manufacture mesh and not the nerves, uh, and I wanted to jump in and answer that. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so actually we don't need to create mesh. Uh, you know, Rhino can, can directly uh, machine the surfaces. I think Rhino is doing that just to, just for uh, convenience here and for display yes. purposes. Yes, and 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 um, uh, to make to to point this out, uh, there is a function um, which converts the uh, T-spline also into uh, uh, Rhino nerves. So it is not necessary to uh, uh, go into this uh, step here, but um, having a mesh also speeds up the uh, demonstration here. So, but the it, it's actually a good question or a good point to make because if high accuracy is required, if you make a mold for uh, uh, some uh, operations, uh, you want to 3D print it or anything, then uh, the NURBS model itself uh, provides uh, the uh, tool generation uh, uh, a little bit more um, freedom regarding accuracy. If you nail it down in a mesh, you, you have the creases, you have the geometry, you cannot become finer than this. But if you throw a NURPS uh, into Rhino camera, uh, then it can choose it. So that's correct. So we can we can use NURPS at this stage um, from uh, which is either with Rhino cam itself, or it is a convert from uh, T splines. Uh, the the T spline NURP surfaces are awesome. It's uh, the way the patches are generated are, is 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 uh, yeah perfect. I've never seen a problem with that. So. Uh, but uh, let me go on with, um, uh, does that answer the, uh, the question for now? Good, is that yeah, sufficient? I think so. Good. Yeah. So we have a few tabs which uh, define the uh, main uh, operation of RhinoCam. It's a setup and in which you basically define which kind of machine type you have, uh, which post-processor you use. Uh, post-processor means uh, addresses the part which um, um, takes a tool pass um, and converts it into a language for a machine. There are so many machines out there which speak slightly different languages that uh, there are different uh, post processors, but basically all uh, makes a machine move pretty much to the same uh, position. So this is where it defines us. Uh, this here is called Mach 3 RSC. RSC are my initials because I modified it, which also leads to a nice point. Uh, Maxsoft allows you to modify, add, and create those posts yourself, which is very neat. Uh, and then I can define a stock, which is a virtual material, which will be the victim of virtual cutting to see in a simulation if this is what I want to get out of it. And then I have machine operation sets, and this is empty right now. And this is filled with the create tab, which leads to the different uh, operations Max, uh, Max, uh, Maxsoft uh, RhinoCam can uh, provide. Uh, one is uh, 2.5D um, for the uninitiated. Uh, if I just have a couple of uh, circles here and a couple of uh, rectangles, I can uh, use those commands to uh, just make a, a pocket into, that, uh, into those shapes and I can define the depths, uh, but the outline is pretty much all I need for those uh, operations. Also V-carving you've seen in the beginning of my presentation, that uh, door segment I made. This is actually generated with the V-carving um, routines from Microsoft. Uh, then I have the uh, 3D uh, strategies, which are um, uh, very, very complete. I encourage you to go to the Microsoft uh, website and download the manuals because the uh, um, strategies are uh, listed there. Um, and we have the 4D, which is like working like a gyro spit, basically, to uh, carve something out of a rotating axis. And then we have drilling operations, uh, which allow me to uh, use, to, to chuck a drill into the uh, uh, collet of my spindle and then drill deep holes, for example, while the drilling uh, is, is, is uh, uh, slowly advancing uh, up and down. Um, yeah, those are the basic strategies. In our case, we keep it simple again. 
um, we can spend the whole day in, in discussing uh, different strategies um, and uh, we'll just take uh, a so-called parallel finishing path which uh, is opening here. I can select uh, machining regions and I have defined a simple curve, a, a rectangle around this uh, piece which um, is then uh, defining the region RhinoCam should look at. Um, the, this could be a very big part with lots of lots of different uh, segments and uh, with a curve around a focus uh, it allows me to specify which part of my big uh, project I want to machine. So this is defining where it should look at. Then I can define a, uh, a, a tool uh, which uh, is a sixteenth of an inch tool here already prepared. A flute length, tool length, tool holder, di diameters and stuff. Um, RhinoCam is, in, is able to uh, provide information if uh, you cut very deep and very complex passes then uh, it, will, it will show you where your uh, uh, spindle would collide with existing geometry if you fill in this with meaningful parameters. Um, yeah, uh, tools, there is, um, I didn't show this, uh, but it doesn't look like it here, but there is a big tool library, a management, management system behind this, which allows you to uh, uh, keep your zoo of different cutting tools organized and then uh, load them here um, as necessary for smaller projects. I, I must say that I'm guilty of just uh, entering them every time I'm not loading it. Um, I'm, I'm not really utilizing that a lot, but it's a bigger shops and you can organize everything. Then uh, here with speeds and speeds I can tell uh, the system uh, uh, the spindle speed, how fast uh, the uh, spindle cutting spindle uh, should rotate while cutting. Then I have the different speeds for uh, plunge, approach, engage. Uh, here are uh, different color segments. Uh, this is the uh, plunge part so I can have it very quickly go down and I can sneak up on the material slowly engage and then speed up to the to the cutting. I, I can control this very fine. Again uh, using a very brittle small tiny tool with a big 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 lean machine uh, makes it necessary to uh, fine tune this otherwise you end up with a pile of broken tools um, and this is obviously a typo because retraction can be very fast and um, yeah, that's the feed and speed. Entry and exit, uh, I can control how the cutting tool descends into the uh, workpiece on an angle, in a radial motion, or simply uh, straight up and down. I hear it set straight up and down. Um, specifically with metal cutting, <coughs> having this is essential because uh, some cutting tools do not allow you to plunge straight down and then it is necessary to uh, have the control over so-called engage motions. You will see in a second life uh, uh, what that means. Uh, Z containment means where is the top of my material. Here I can set all sorts of uh, safe distances so uh, cutting tools do not run into materials. Um, then the uh, cut parameters are, are important. This uh, here specifies how close I uh, keep to the uh, state of the um, geometry. Sometimes uh, there are reasons for roughing or for finishing not to be too accurate or to be very, very, very accurate. Then cut direction is a very interesting point. You know the cutting tool only rotates in one direction and here you can control which way the cutting tool is um, presented to the material uh, only in one direction all the time or mixed in both directions backwards and forwards. Uh, if you have very brittle materials like Macassar ebony in woodworking or palm wood, then it is very, very good if you can control this to minimize blowout. And in uh, metalworking, uh, you can determine uh, the uh, tool marks maybe you, you may leave. Um, then start uh, side, uh, you can determine which uh, corner of the piece you will start with your uh, tool pass. You can see here the uh, direction as a start point changing. And here angle of cuts is a very, very important part in woodworking, specifically when we make our life easy here uh, in, in just uh, using one uh, uh, method to cut the entire piece. Um, angle of cuts I'll set this to 45 degrees right away uh, because if the cutting tool would 
go back and forth to cut out the shape um, through solid material, if it would dive in here and it would cut over there, it would be broken till it's here because it would have to dig an enormous, enormously deep trench with a very, very small uh, tool and the uh, probability is very high that there is a little piece of material wedging in and just snapping it off. What we will do with a 45 degree cut is we will sink in here and basically like a drill and the first move already which we will create will be a step to the front and uh, a line to the back. However small it is, it already has uh, a gap to the back which will only grow further and further as we go in. So again, Maxsoft to the rescue, it allows us to define those things. And here is um, a step over control, how big are the steps we're going to make to carve with the tool to carve out the uh, uh, geometry here. So the, the finer this is, the longer it will take, the better the result is, the coarser it is, the coarser it will look and the faster it is. And as it is in real life, it's like a budget thing, how nice do you want to have it uh, look in which time uh, available. So in metalworking this has more tighter uh, tolerances because of the forces acting on the uh, machine bit. In woodworking, we go anywhere between 45 and 3 percent um, and don't care much about anything else. And I think 25 percent with the distance we do here in aluminum would just end the bit right away. So good. Uh, long story short, this is pretty much everything we have to uh, check and, and set and then I can say generate. Um, it flickers around and what we see here is a uh, is the tool pass su superseded to the um, top of the, the turquoise uh, lines are actually the flight path if you want to name it like this of the tool and um, if I zoom in here you can see the yellow line which goes right into the material basically as I said drills in goes over steps up steps back, goes over, steps up, steps back, and so on, till it is finished on the other side and retracts here. So um, I can now check the tool pass itself, which gives me information about uh, the uh, uh, where it goes. I can check uh, roughly the values and see, okay, this is not uh, 30 feet in the ground. <laughs> Don't believe me, it can happen. <laughs> And RPMs, everything looks good, and there are also information which are very valuable and fairly accurate regarding the uh, times it will take to machine the port. This is about 35 minutes. Um, rest assured, you will not have to look 35 minutes at a uh, video. Um, we split this up. If I would say, oh, this, this is not something I expected, I know this part only should cut uh, uh, in half the time I can check again feeds and speeds because this is most likely the uh, part where I made an error. I can go like to 600 inch per minute which I could certainly do with a little bit more of a bigger cutter and generate it again and I see ha, the whole thing can be cut in uh, five minutes and it can be cut in five minutes just not that pretty. Um, then um, there are a couple of functions which are really cool. I can uh, transform the tool pass, reverse the tool pass. I can instance the tool pass. I can take this pattern and if I have a 4 by 8 sheet, I can tell RhinoCam, please make 10 by 20 or 30 of those um, parts and I don't have to do anything in RhinoCam. In, in Rhino, duplicates a model or anything, the tool pass will simply be insta instanced. I can do that in z-axis as well, um, which is very useful according to Uday for uh, roughing. So which means I can uh, take this and, and copy it three times and cut through a thicker layer of material without any uh, further uh, ado. I can fit arcs, I can do a lot of other things and for me personally, the most fantastic thing is I can take, I can select those curves and I can convert them back into Rhino curves. So I can take those generated curves put them back into Rhino and use them for extrusions, modeling and other other very, very cool uh, options uh, leading to very artistic or uh, uh, structural uh, models. So I think without further ado, uh, we generated the, uh, the tool paths. I can uh, basically now so-called post it and I will just um, I think you should also show the simulation aspect of it. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Um, 
I just show, uh, once I post those instructions when I'm happy with them, uh, then this is uh, pretty much what we look at. But let, let, me, let, me, let me go back one second to the uh, simulation. How silly of me. Um, in the simulation uh, tab, um, it, it's, it's a nice workflow anyway. So you, you go to set up, you create something, you go to simulate, and you're pretty much done. It's, it, it guides you, the whole system guides you through the process. So it's not very confusing. Here I get the definition uh, for my uh, virtual box stock. Um, and I uh, tell it the uh, zero point is here. This is where I basically drive the machine to with the tip of the tool uh, later and uh, tell it once it is right there, this is zero, zero, zero. So all programs involved are uh, in the know. Then the, the part size is six by seven inches, one, six, one inch high. It, the height here doesn't matter because it will just protrude to the bottom a little bit more, a bit thicker. And there we go. We have our orange virtual foam block and uh, the tool pass, which I can actually uh, switch off. Oops. And then I can uh, let the simulation run. And here's my little cutting tool. And it does what I told it to do. It just races across the surface and uh, uh, cuts out the part. It, it really does look rough, but believe me, once it's cut, it is surprisingly nice. Uh, in reality, of course, I would uh, use the NURBS, which would take all the facets away. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, coarseness of the toolpath here is not really an, an issue once you uh, uh, start uh, woodworking. So now it's almost done. I'll just let this run in uh, real time for a second. The funny thing the smaller this becomes, the faster the machine goes back and forth. So in the end, it's like, whoop, whoop, it's really funny. Zip, and the part is done. So now, if I would like to send this uh, to a client, this, this doesn't really look that cool. If I want to, uh, in quotes, sexify this a lot, <coughs> uh, Microsoft offers me a really, really great opportunity to uh, export this carved model to an STL file, which is really awesome, because I can load this in any render engine again. And uh, as you remember, the uh, carved door part, which I showed you in the dark wood, is actually uh, nothing else than a, uh, a wood textured uh, STL file from uh, the pre-run. And um, so that was quite impressive how that came out. So you can use uh, RhinoCam uh, also to generate an STL model or to take the cut geometry uh, as you expect it and uh, render it in any other application. You can also use it actually to model stuff. So there are a lot of options in, in this simple uh, uh, line again. So now uh, back where I uh, uh, was, um, I can just post the instructions. And uh, the instructions look like that. It loads it in a notepad. Um, <clears throat> Here is, for example, S18000 that switches on the spindle, um, sets the spindle speed to 18,000 RPM. Then M03, M08 is start as a dust collector. And uh, then we have the first uh, positioning command, go to Z coordinate 0 0.0388. And then it just goes from there to uh, a set feed speeds and more coordinates and it starts to uh, walk off the pattern I gave to it. So after a while you see in the beginning there was no model so it's only X and Y uh, uh, movements to clean out this flat and after a short period of time it will encounter the uh, geometry and we see that there are bursts of the positionings as well which means that here it starts to probably cut um, right there the first couple of uh, cuts. So, and uh, a brief check to see that this is uh, uh, 0 0.15 uh, deep um, makes me confident. So this would be three inches deep and the cutter is only three sixteenths long. Then you know you'll be ready for a world of, in, of pain when you actually <laughs> release this on the machine. Because the machine doesn't care. She says, well, the big guy knows what he wants. I will just drill the bit through the uh, table. Not that this ever happened to me. So, uh, and after quite some while, what did we say, 34 minutes, uh, we stop the program, switch off the dust collector, and end the session. So, 
that's pretty much uh, the modeling part. And um, now we can uh, very quickly look at when I can pull up my uh, media player again. Now we can basically look at the uh, machine running. Here you can see uh, uh, the uh, here you can see the coordinates of the G code, which you saw as a uh, file which has been loaded in here by my Swiss memory uh, memory plug. Uh, you can see the uh, now this uh, x, y, and z coordinates. They're alive, and this is actually um, exactly where the machine is in in coordinates right now. And uh, then here you can see the lights are blinking, the signals are are are, are uh, flowing, and here is the start of the session. And here is it dives in three sixteenths and starts to cut uh, the part. And as you can remember, there is quite a little bit of a uh, flat part to uh, overcome. And this is the beauty of uh, fast forward. So those are the first few minutes. And here again, you can see the coordinate move uh, of the uh, machine. This is the first machine we ever built with those bells, and we were very skeptical, but it was so cheap. And uh, it turned out to be such a great uh, system to drive a woodworking machine. So now, I'll just, uh, here you see the machine going up and down. And it's nothing else than the translated uh, commands in the file you've seen before. And it basically traces the um, turquoise lines uh, from the Rhino uh, session here. Oops. Those turquoise lines are basically now uh, machined in uh, in real time. So this takes 30 minutes, and I'll spare you the 30 minutes. At one stage, I decided to uh, put my shop watch there, uh, just to find <laughs> to my horror in a minute that the dust collector here was about to swallow the watch. So that was one of the funny moments when I recorded that. <laughs> I just thought of the blink of my eye when it started to disappear there. So um, I moved the dust collector a little bit away. So we're here at uh, 2.10, one day where I started to cut it, 2.12, 13. And you wouldn't believe the noise I have in my headset right now, 22. 27. When I mention shop watch, it's interesting. In my shop, we do so many different things. I have a uh, garment stand. I have a totally shredded uh, overall, which I wear when I'm in a shop like this. I have my jeans hanging there with my ch shirt for my office. And I have my uh, suit if I have to run out to a client. <laughs> so, and here we go, we have uh, 2.30, and as you can see, I mentioned before, it uh, speeds up uh, the movement a little bit. And uh, there we go, it just finished, and the spindle stops. Zingo, and we can take uh, this way and moves the part out. So usually you cannot see this uh, in that depth because we have uh, mechanisms which prevent that you can go up that close to a machine uh, because the machine can be unreliable, servo motors can fail, and then you have six horsepowers uh, throwing stuff at you. And uh, that's not very nice. So this is uh, that movie uh, regarding our B. I have very quickly uh, thrown in a uh, a movie with a V-carving, just to, uh, for one minute. Here you can see, by the way, the fourth axis, which was uh, referred to. Um, it has a chuck uh, where you can put a rotary part in. It has a, uh, another support on the other end. And then I can drive this uh, uh, tool, basically, on top of this part. And while this rotates, it can cut into the part, uh, thus creating things like the screwdriver. And uh, the uh, I, I modeled this pattern in Rhino, and I duplicated it four times, and I changed uh, each quadrant around a little bit, so it breaks the uh, monotony to the eye. And uh, after a while, it turned out real nice. The client was very, very happy, and actually is uh, 
ordering a door with about 12 of those cassettes, which are a little bit larger. So it does provide income. Uh, carving this would probably take a whole week. It will, re it will require cleaning up for about 20 minutes when it's done with a chisel to get rid of a couple of flakes. And I might even go a little bit slower with the um, uh, final wood. By the way, this is hard maple, which is about the worst thing to machine. It's the reason why we have uh, some stuff left in a while, because nobody wants to deal with it. And uh, here is the uh, result. And this basically concludes my little hasty demonstration from idea through conception through a very brief T-spine modeling into machinable parts. I hope it was uh, uh, explanatory and fun to watch. Thank you very much, Rainer. I, I I think I mentioned this. Just I sit in my office every day on the computer and just to see see the whole process of going from the CAD model to actually getting out in the shop and having the wood machined is just it's, it's really neat to see the whole process and how 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 straightforward it, how straightforward that is. Yeah, we'll so. give you a rebate on the machine if you want to buy one. <laughs> Great, <laughs> sounds good. Um, uh, talking of machines, I just wanted to chime in here and say that uh, RhinoCam is not restricted to just Rainer's machine. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Our three controllers. So we, out of the box, we handle over 200 controllers, and we also have a, a configurable post-processor generator. So if you have your own machine, if you build your own machine or, some, or you have some other manufacturer's machine, we can write a post-processor very quickly. Yeah, I just pulled it up. Um, I just pulled it up here. And the... Uh, da, 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 da. And uh, here's uh, a very brief uh, look uh, from A to uh, uh, Z, uh, Y, <laughs> uh, which kind of machines are uh, supported right away. And I, I worked on a lot of those shop bots and shop savers and stuff, and the, the posts delivered with it are, are all flawless. And uh, if I would just go and, and uh, uh, just uh, edit one, then this is the screen you would have if you would have to define your own, which gives you for motion, circles, spirals, helical, spindles, feed rates, gives you all the options uh, to define your own stuff, uh, which is extremely easy. You've seen before feed rates were like F50 or so, and this is basically what you define, feed rate code, and the feed rate, and then it says F50, and it gives you even a uh, sample output. So it's you don't have to be an engineer uh, or rocket scientist to define your own uh, post processor. So, um, good point. It, it has a lot of machines it can control, and if you have one, um, which where you know which commands are required to make it move, you can enter those here, and you can end up with your uh, own machine. Okay. Um, we have some other questions to get to. Before we do, though, I just um, I just I'd, I'd promised an offer at the beginning of the webinar. Um, we've just been really pleased as we've gotten to know uh, the guys at Mexoft more over the past few months, how, how simple it really is to go from uh, T-Spine's model to have it machined using RhinoCam. So we arranged with them um, until, let's see, what, what was it, Anita, Anita until the uh, August 16th, any T-Spine's owner uh, can, buy, uh, can buy RhinoCam for 10% off, and, um, and they've and we've agreed to that same deal with T-Spoint. So we'd just like to make it a little bit even more accessible to all of our customers to be able to complete their organic surfacing to, to design pipeline. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and email out the details of that in the follow-up email for the webinar tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we would be more than happy to offer any of your customers a 10% discount on RhinoCam. Uh, of course, we would also be very happy to support every single one of those customers. We do that free and uh, always available here in California to answer any of your questions. Okay, so let me, there, there's just a few more questions coming in. Um, Rainer, let me kind of pass on some to you from about, more about your machine. Um, <laughs> Let's see, and if you could maybe just step back from the mic a little bit more again, we're getting some more feedback. Oh, that um, yeah, that, yeah, that's better. So I kind of lost a little phone thingy as you as you. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and Rainer, I'm I don't even know what a lot of these words mean. So hopefully you can help me out. Um, any reason to run Mach three versus EMC two? 
Does that mean anything um, to you? Yeah, the, there are different machine controllers, you know, the, um, which is a box which actually, um, um, it, it's, a, it's a software part which translates a go to X, Y, and Z position into uh, signals for the motors. It's uh, basically uh, sending the army, you know, to make 10 steps to the front, to, the, to, to forward, and 10 steps to the left. That's, that is a part which basically translates uh, from, uh, from Mexoff to, uh, to, to the physical machine uh, drives, amplifiers, if you want to name it like this. And they are uh, very commercial ones, uh, pretty much uh, the 200 ones uh, supported from Mexoft. And uh, the two are, um, uh, one of them are, is, is uh, very cheap and commercial. It's called Max 3 and it is made for general purpose machines uh, which can be built yourself so that's about I think just below two hundred dollars and then there is a module which is called EMC uh, which has been created initially by NASA by the government and was released to the public domain and was enthusiastically uh, uh, developed um, by um, basically in, I, I call them engineers they are also hobbyists but it requires a lot of knowledge to work with this uh, source code so I say engineers, and that's for free, uh, and it's Linux-based. Um, Mac 3 runs on Windows, and EMC runs on uh, Linux. Um, and uh, I just say um, uh, the Linux version also uh, is based on a so-called real-time kernel, um, which means that uh, the uh, machine controller gets a de de defined amount of uh, CPU time uh, ryth rhythmically, which is uh, like as safe as a dollar in the bank. Um, well, I'm sure maybe maybe not. <laughs> but uh, Max 3 basically has sometimes issues with um, on slower machines that uh, Windows is is. <laughs> yeah, just just imagine you're cutting apart and, and Windows decides to update your browser, which you forgot to close in the background. That usually uh, leads to uh, humorous results in Windows. And if the browser in uh, Max 3 does, in EMC Linux does that, uh, um, EMC, the machine controller, still gets its time slices as precise as um, possible. So the reason to use one or the other is comfort. Um, if I go to a... Um, uh, warehouse and I buy a cheap computer and I throw a parallel port in it and I throw Mac 3 on it, even if it costs $180, I'm done. I can plug it in, I'm ready to go. If I use EMC um, and, and people, it, it's, it's not really what I want to say and because it might sound a little bit demeaning, but it's, it's a tool for the with kids. Um, because you have to be familiar with Linux, you have to understand how Linux works. You might have to be able to uh, edit files in the Linux environment. Okay. And, uh, so it is more com it's more complex. It is uh, it's less comfortable. Okay. Well, that extremely powerful. That sounds good. There's there's more questions I mean, I want to make sure that we get to. But that sounds you like it's a good a good good go basic ahead. overview. So on the machine, um, how many ounces per inch are on the mo on the motors? Uh, the motors ounce inches. I don't really have a uh, figure for that because I calculated the uh, horsepowers. Um, the uh, uh, y the x axis has six horsepower on it. The y axis motor can deliver up to three horsepowers in a pulse, and uh, both motors, uh, both gearboxes are good for about one to two horsepower continuous, <laughs> which can pretty much tear every bit off. But the reason why we chose those over dimensions is A, to test the servo drive, which we have co-developed with a Finnish company, uh, which can also power big, uh, bigger machines, uh, which are not necessarily CNC machines. And uh, we clamp very different cutting systems onto that gantry as well for tests and trials. As I said, it's a prototyping machine and sometimes you need uh, the acceleration um, to, uh, yeah, to have it function, so we sometimes need that, that force. But yes, I would say uh, realistically somewhere like above 1,500 ounce, ounce inches for sure. Okay. Um, what, what are the specs on your servos, like amps or volts for the mill? Uh, servos goes up go up to uh, uh, two two hundred I think two hundred eighty volts uh, 
and uh, go up to 25 amps. Okay. Um, let's see, so what are some other questions? They can be stacked, they can talk to each other, those drives. It's uh, quite amazing. <laughs> Okay, it looks like a lot of the other questions we've been able to type back some uh, some answers to. Uh, let's see, are you, Anita, are you seeing any other, any other questions that, that I'm missing? There was one from Seth. Uh, I'm not sure if we fully answered that, uh, you know, about the uh, uh, toolpath control using curves rather than surfaces. Uh, we're not quite sure if you've answered it, so if he wants to have a follow-up question, we're we're open. Okay. Um, let's see here. So here's another question: Can Rhino Cam be used with a rapid manufacturing machine like a SLA or an SDM machine? Uh, Rhino Cam is for a CNC machine, uh, so we really don't interface with uh, rapid prototyping machines directly. Okay, let's see. I think that's just been a lot of questions answered, but I think we've we've taken care of most of them through typing. So. Um, yeah, I think, didn't you want to uh, show a little bit more um, T-spine wizardry quickly? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I guess if there's anything anyone would like to see specifically in T-spines, please go ahead and ask that. We do have a lot of um, videos on our, on our website, um, and maybe I can even, maybe I'll even take back the, the presenter. Um, but if you, let's see. If you go to our T-Spines website, um, we just barely added some new uh, videos as well. So if you go to T-Spines for Rhino, um, we have some new new videos here showing how to um, quickly make uh, arrive at a shape and design with T-Spines. Also how to how to work with T-Spines to create smooth buns and transitions. Um, yeah, so if there are any specific questions, I can go ahead and address those. But, but otherwise, I would just recommend uh, going to our website and checking out our uh, our various uh, tutorials. We have a lot of video, tut video tutorials here. Um, okay, it looks like a bunch of more questions just came in. Um, future plans for for the Mac. Um, Rhino just barely, or I guess it's been about a year ago, they came out with the first versions of Rhino for the Mac. And uh, that's something that I know here at T-Spoins we're looking forward to supporting. Uh, we have to wait a little bit because they, they don't have an API available for third-party developers yet. Um, but we're we're really looking forward to when that's ready, so we can go ahead and, and move these points over there. Are it, are there similar plans at Megsoft or? Uh, again, we are also looking at it. Uh, we're watching it closely as well uh, because uh, you know when Rhino goes over to Mac, uh, we would like to get an idea of how many uh, users out there would really like to get a CAM product out there as well. So okay, uh, we like to we don't like to be on the bleeding edge of technology. Let me put it that way. Um, so here's a question from uh, about the differences between version 2.2 and 2.3 in T-Spoins. 2.3 is just a free upgrade, so I would just recommend downloading that. Um, a lot of it, there's a lot of new languages with the, like Italian, French, Spanish that we're supporting, um, better grasshopper support. So I'd recommend just, just getting a free upgrade, um, and you can get that at our website. So... Um, Let's see. Here's another question. Do you have any experience with high-speed milling strategies? Either Rainer or the guys at Microsoft, any, any input on that? Um, uh, I'll have Rainer answer it. I think the question was more for the machining part, and then maybe I can talk about the Rhino Cam part of it afterwards. Um, 
I, if, if it's about uh, uh, those high-speed machines with like 20 to 50,000 RPM uh, spinning tools, no, no. We we only work with uh, uh, modified bridge ports, and 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 the fastest we have access to is a Haas mill, <coughs> which has uh, I think goes up to 20,000. But where we scared using that uh, because of coolant and aluminum issues, um, and no, no, not really. It's uh, it's a realm where uh, we haven't even had uh, uh, requests for. As far as RhinoCam, yeah, we're definitely looking at high-speed uh, machining strategies. We will have a module or at least the components of it coming out in our next release, uh, slated uh, sometime in early next year. Okay, um, here's another question about Rhino 564-bit compatibility timeline. Um, again, this is the the same kind of the same issue of just waiting for McNeil to have um, a stable API available, and I know we're looking forward to moving ahead with that as as soon as that that hits. And so, I wish we could be more specific on the timing of that, but um, McNeil themselves don't quite know that. But my my hope is in the next six months maybe, but I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and just see how, how Rhino 5 comes along. As far as RhinoCam, we have RhinoCam running in 64-bit uh, already. Uh, it's, it's on a beta at, the, at this point, uh, but it will be available when Rhino 64-bit, uh, Rhino 5.0 comes out. So. Yeah, what we do here is so we we <coughs> create a lot of meshes with uh, ZBrush, uh, which uh, generates very very dense meshes uh, for a lot of geometry, and uh, we're always surprised how quick uh, RhinoCam is uh, able to generate two passes from those uh, very very heavy meshes. So even in 32-bit, it's uh, uh, possible to get a few hundred thousand polygons in there. So here's a question about the best way to create a surface with holes in T-splines. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do that. One is just to, with T-splines, you can just select a hole and delete it, or select a face and delete it to make a hole. Um, if you want to get an exact, um, a more exact hole, then you can just trim it, and it will turn into a rhino trimmed nerves, but the surface will stay exactly the same besides uh, the hole. Um, we have some tutorials showing that, and I can I can send a link about that as well. Okay, well maybe we'll just uh, wait a couple more seconds to see if any more questions come in. But otherwise, uh, thanks again for attending the webinar.